Okay, hi guys, welcome to another um, Monday night study. Today what I wanted to talk to you about, just a short study on some definitions. In the New Testament, or actually in the Old Testament, in the Minor Prophets, we have uh, several points or phrases for the Messiah. And reading through the Old Testament, especially for Christians that uh, follow the New Testament, uh, it's obvious that it's for the Messiah. So we have this term uh, or phrase, the teacher of righteousness. And then we also have the rod of Jesse, for instance, and the son of righteousness that arises with healing in his wings. And these are things that I've, I've known about in the Old Testament for a while, pointing to Messiah. But there's actual several points or times in the Damascus document and a few other places that talk about the teacher of righteousness. And it's an interesting thing because today we'll still have, and I understand there's a lot of Jewish uh, people that don't want it to mean Messiah because it's too Christian. And so they'll try to come up with ideas like, well, maybe it was the founder of the Essenes, or maybe it was another guy or this person or that person. The, uh, the manuscripts make it very clear. The teacher of righteousness is the person that the lying priest put to death about 40 years before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. So that in no way could be the founder of the Essenes or anything like that. He'd have to be two to 300 years old uh, for something like that to happen. So it's obvious we're talking about someone they considered the Messiah that died around 32 AD. Um, you know, and they connect him with a lot of the other prophecies too, like the Melchizedekian priest, who is God incarnate, who comes to die for our sins in 32 AD, according to their calendar. So it's really interesting to look at that. So I wanted to kind of do that tonight because I want us to have a really firm grip on that kind of thing. So this is me still working on the Damascus document and uh, I'm coming along pretty good. I've got the covenant of Damascus pretty much done uh, as a rough draft. And now I'm working on the community rule. And then in connection with that, there's 4Q instruction. It's all basically the same kind of stuff. And I think when we pull it all together, it'll make a lot of sense. Um, so, um, and then we'll have, there's, there's books that are mentioned in the Damascus Covenant and in the community role, like the Book of Time Divisions, which is a prophecy book. Book of uh, Hagi, which is a herbal medicine book and then the way of light versus the sons of darkness and a few other things like that. So we'll have a chap chapter in here on the teacher of righteousness. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, and so basically there's the teacher of righteousness and the son of righteousness that arise with healing in his wings. And we've seen that in many places, but let's start first by understanding as a Christian, there's a first coming and a second coming. And as we see in the Testaments of the Patriarchs, they had always been taught one Messiah with two comings. And that's fairly clear. And so we have this, this concept of the festivals or the Moedim teaching prophecy. And we're probably very familiar with that. For instance, the um, um, Passover Seder very clearly teaches on the first coming of the Messiah, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, very clear in the symbolism. And then there's Pentecost and then the fall festivals teaching on the second coming, that kind of thing. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this. In James 5, 7, and this is a quote from the King James, and I'll be explaining the, the quotes to you here, but James is talking about the second coming and the fact that everything's planned out, so we need to be patient and wait for the Lord to do what he does in his own timetable. And in the midst of that, just be righteous. And he says in uh, James 5, 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of our Lord. So we're supposed to patiently wait for the second coming. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Now, this is a, a term for crops. And basically, you have two rainy seasons. And as far as planting, um, the time periods around there, depending on how much water your crops need, you plant them at the proper time. But 
you can't have multiple seasons in one year unless you have multiple rainy seasons or can do that kind of thing. Um, some crops can. Uh, barley harvest, I think, is quick enough that I think there's two uh, barley harvests. There's one wheat harvest. And then uh, olives and grapes take years to bring in a harvest. So uh, that kind of a thing. But in this case, James is actually quoting a prophecy from Joel. I knew it was in Joel, but I didn't realize it was in Joel and uh, uh, Hosea and a, a few other places till I started looking at the Damascus Covenant. So the whole concept here is that the Messiah comes in the early and the latter rain, or in other words, in the spring and in the fall. And the festivals around the spring and the fall teach on the first and the second comings. So this is an old idiom, uh, the Messiah coming or salvation coming, Yeshua coming, uh, in the early and the latter rain. And that's the way that that works. So he's actually quoting this concept from uh, Joel, which we'll see in a minute. So again, remember the concept is be patient to the coming of the Lord. So we're the focus James is having is on the second coming. We've been here. We've seen the first coming. We were his disciples, James, Peter, Paul, John, and they're saying he'll, he'll come back. There's a second coming. So just be patient. And he comes like the early rain and the latter rain in a year's time. So, and it goes prophetically with the calendar. So here is the quote that he's doing, and this is from Joel 2.23. And um, actually, before we do that, let me just pull up that in the King James, just so you can kind of see that I'm not tweaking anything. So in Joel 2.23, I'll show you what it says in the King James, and it looks a little different. King James is my favorite, uh, but at the same time, we have um, others here. Let's see. Okay, so 223, and it says here, let me just make this bigger. Might be easier to do. 223, there we go. So be glad, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, because he's given you... Oh, this is a bad translation. Let me run back, run back to King James. Here we go. Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. And this is really interesting because it can be translated like this. And he will come, cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. And again, we're talking about the concept of the calendars. There's a fall calendar and a spring calendar. The first months of that would be Nisan, where you've got Passover. And the first month of the other calendar is Tishrei, where you've got the High Holy Days. So in other words, we could be talking about the Messiah coming in two separate places or two separate times, fall feast, spring feast. But this is kind of coded. It says the former rain moderately. And it comes, the former rain moderately comes down like the former rain and the latter rain. That's kind of an odd thing if you're going to translate it that way. The spring rain comes down like the spring rain and the fall rain. That doesn't make sense. So when we do this, if we go ahead and flip this over to the King James Plus, and we're just going to see this here. The uh, He has given you the former rain, and we can look on that, and it's the word mora. Now, mora actually means uh, teacher. And as you can see that it says there is the concept of an archer or a teacher or rain. It's the idea of something shooting forth. So it's by, um, if you're talking about a teacher, it's someone that says, you're going to memorize this. There's going to be a test. We're going to make sure that you memorize it, that you learn this, as opposed to just allowing people to learn as they go in their own way. So there's two different teaching styles. In this case, mora means teacher. Uh, it could also be archer, and it could also be the early rain, because the early rains come very heavily, I guess is the idea. And moderately, so the former rain, the heavy, moderate rain, again, it's kind of odd, right? The heavy, moderate rain. Anyway, so the word translated moderate, moderately is uh, zadaka. 
Zedak is righteousness. Zedak is a righteous act. And as you can see here, that it's normally translated righteousness, okay, or rightness, uh, justice, moral virtue. Uh, figuratively, it can be justice, moderately, act of righteousness. There's nothing in here about, uh, well, moderately. And that moderate righteousness, injustice is kind of an odd, odd way of doing it. So with this in mind, you can see how we get this. For some reason, they're translating this, the former reign moderately. The former, and again, this is mora, meaning uh, early reign, archer teaching. So the heavy former reign moderately will come down like the heavy for, first reign moderately in the first and the second month. So this is kind of an odd translation. So here is the way the Dead Sea Scrolls translate it. Be glad then, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you Mora Zedek, the teacher of righteousness. Okay, and that is our Messiah. We, we should know this. He's given you the teacher of righteousness. That's why we're rejoicing. And he will, who's the he? It's either God, which is the Father, in this case is not going to descend, or the teacher of righteousness. So the teacher of righteousness, he will descend for you as the rain, as the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. That makes a whole lot more sense. So the Messiah is what we rejoice in, and he's going to have two separate visitations, a first coming and a second coming, a former rain and a latter rain. Just like you've got two seasons of rain per year, in the spring and the fall, there will be spring and fall festivals that teach on the comings of the Messiah or the teacher of righteousness. So you can see how he's doing here, going back to James, be patient about the coming of our Lord, the second coming, because he will come, you know, be patient until he receives the early and the latter rain. This one says God will send us the teacher of righteousness he will descend like the rain, the former and the latter rain in the first month. So especially this, this phrase in the first month, that's definitely talking about spring and fall seasons, spring and fall Moedim, rituals that point to the comings of Messiah. So very, very interesting. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, that in itself would be enough. And I knew about Joel and I knew about James. I did not know about Hosea. So this is going to be the same kind of thing. Hosea 10, 12. Let me, let me first, uh, well, let's just go on with this one. We'll look to the next one here in a second. Um, so here's the teacher of righteousness again. Uh, Hosea 10, 12. Hosea says, show yourselves in, sow rather, just like the crop thing. Again, you're planting, you're sowing, hopefully you get the rains and you get crops. So sow yourselves you and I are supposed to sow ourselves in righteousness. We can think about the parable Jesus did about the wheat and the tares. So sow ourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until the teacher of righteousness comes to you. Again, that's uh, Yora Zedek. Yora is the other word that can be translated rain also. Uh, but it's also teacher, and it's the idea, the mora is the teacher, like the arrows, the sharp to the point, take the test. A yora is teaching in general, but it can be an easy way of teaching. Um, a child, for instance, can be sent off to a school to learn to cook, and there will be tests and, you know, all this stuff. Or you can simply watch mom and dad cook, pick up things as you go along, and by the time you're 18, you're a fairly good cook. But there were no tests, no pressure. It's a different teaching style. So that's really interesting to me. So the Lord, the teacher of righteousness, is both formal, specific, things are important, and then the lifestyle that we have, he'll guide us as we go. The things you're supposed to do are not the things that I'm supposed to do, and vice versa, on some things specifics that God wants you to do with your life, specifics that he wants me to do with my life. 
But there are, then there are specifics we all adhere to. We all have to accept uh, Yeshua the Messiah as our Lord and Savior. We have to try to do righteousness. Uh, none of us are allowed to go out and murder and steal and things like that. So there's specifics and generals. But notice that then. So he's saying here in Hosea that you should sow yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, and break up the fallow ground. So the fallow ground is another symbol like the uncircumcised heart, the idea of pride. So be humble, understand, just believe what you're told. You and I are sinners. We do some things right and some things wrong. Some of the things we do wrong, we know it's wrong. Other things we actually might think they're right, but they're wrong. Why do we get confused? Because we have a sin nature and it messes us up. If you just accept that and go forward, then you can have a relationship with God. So you can't have an uncircumcised hard heart. You can't be hard hearted. Sow in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up that follow, fallow ground of your heart. It's time to seek the Lord and you need to continue doing this until the teacher of righteousness comes and then a new dispensation of, or age of grace will occur and some things are different. And this is what the prophet Hosea is teaching. That's really fantastic. Now, when we back up, uh, that's 10, 12, but if you back up to chapter 6, uh, he talks about this. And in 6, 3, Hosea says, Then we will know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, just like the day dawning. Peter uses that about the day star arising in our hearts, so the symbolism is the same. And of course, the sun of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So he says here, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he will come to us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. And that makes it pretty clear. The Lord is coming, and his going forth or his appearing is just like the morning when the day dawns. It's night, it's darkness, you can't do anything, it's horrible. As far as you know, we're all going to die. It's just horrible. And then all of a sudden, the sun arises, and you can see everything. And then the night, the disease, the attacks, the animals, or whatever is going on, you can see them. And now everything's fine. So the morning comes, and every, the darkness flees. And of course, if his morning comes, and there is no sunset, no night ever again, then there is no problem. Everything's fixed. But he comes like the morning, like the latter rain and the former rain to the earth. So same thing again in the first month, spring and fall festivals. Um, so we go on here. Now, here's the prophet Malachi. Malachi 4, uh, 2 says, uh, But unto you that fear my name shall the, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you will go forth and grow up as calves in a stall. See, a calf out in the wilderness may or may not get food, may or may not be eaten by a predator. A calf in a stall gets plenty of hay and food. He's fed. He's taken good care of. He's in a stall that protects him from predators. So this whole concept is that when the son of righteousness arises with healing in his wings, that's salvation of our and healing also physically, but the concept of us being uh, made right with the Lord. So we can see here then the son of righteousness and the teacher of righteousness is the Messiah. There's two comings, first and, and second, uh, spring festivals, fall festivals, very, very clear um, at, if you believe in the New Testament. So, so now we go through, and the concept here is that many scholars keep repeating this idea that the teacher of righteousness in the scrolls is the founder of the group. Okay, now they say in the Damascus document, we saw this a week or two ago, in the very beginning of it, it says that the Lord appeared to them because they were trying to figure out what was going on, part of a prophecy of the 390 years. When that was over, it was 197 BC. And when that was over, they said, basically they had a Christophany, the, the word of the Lord appeared to them and help them to understand the prophets were back. And so no matter how you look at that, if the Essene movement officially 
started at 200 BC, 197, and the teacher of righteousness dies in 32 AD, he's, what, 230-some years old. It's not possible. So it's very, very clear that we're talking about the teacher of righteousness being Messiah. So let's look at a few of those things. Um, in the Habakkuk commentary, uh, it reads, um, During the time of the Roman occupation of Israel, which is between 64 BC and 135 BC is when they actually come back. But during that time period, the teacher of righteousness was persecuted by the liar, and you can go back, I think we have at least one or two uh, YouTube videos, and should be on the other uh, the, uh, the website also, on the Pesher Habakkuk, Habakkuk commentary, where we go through all this, so you'll see all this in there. But the teacher of righteousness was persecuted by the liar. He's the official priest, so we know him to be Caiaphas. But this lying priest persecuted and put to death the teacher of righteousness. The people of this apostate prince, or pre priest rather, followed the liar. And it goes on to say they refused to listen to the teacher of righteousness. And they were uh, unfaithful to the new covenant who have not believed in the covenant of God. That's an actual quote from the Habakkuk commentary. So the people that rejected the teacher of righteousness when he tried to bring the new covenant of grace, the new covenant of Damascus, they followed the false priest. And this is what's going on. And the first priest, the false priest persecuted the teacher of righteousness. It goes on to say that these people that followed the false priest would be destroyed by the Roman army at the end of the age. So the end of the age is 75. So sometime before 75 AD, everything would be destroyed. The warriors that fought for him, of course, they're headquartered in the temple of Jerusalem. So that means the temple of Jerusalem will be completely destroyed by the Romans before 75 AD. And it was about five years before. This wicked priest called the liar, it says, committed crimes against the teacher of righteousness and the men of his council. We remember what the Sanhedrin, probably led by Caiaphas or Annas or, some, or both of them, or their proxies. The Sanhedrin took, I think it was Peter and John, told them that they couldn't preach in the name of the Lord and, and had them whipped, remember, in Acts. So they persecuted the Essenes and the Christians, all those that believed in Messiah, that wouldn't follow their command. So again, we're getting back to the same idea that the apostasy, it doesn't matter so much what we're talking about, but the actions behind it. Uh, whether it's a pre-trib, post-trib rapture, whether it's salvation by faith or works, whether it's whatever, the authority of the Pharisees, the authority of the Sadducees, whatever it is we're talking about at some point of doctrine, and somebody gets angry with you enough deciding that they have the authority of the government, to push, and they're going to arrest you, kill you, whatever the case may be, because they are God's instrument, at least that's what they think. And this is the point of the apostasy. If you were to say, I worship Lucifer, I worship Jesus, I worship Buddha, I worship him, you know, Krishna, whatever, and we all disagree, but nobody's going to try to kill anybody. We're going to try to talk to each other and hopefully convert each other. That's what we're going to be trying to do. That is not the epitome of, of the apostasy. It's when things get violent. And we see, we see this even in Protestantism and the fight between the Protestants and the Catholics a couple of hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, and all the other stuff between the Muslims and the Jews and the, the Muslims and the uh, um, Hindus, you know, and the Pakistanis and all that stuff, and all these different things that happen. So this wicked priest, the liar, commits crimes against the teacher of righteousness and the men of his council. So if the teacher of righteousness is the Messiah, who was Jesus Christ, then the men of his council are the apostles and the first century Christians. Up until 75 anyway, because by that time everything is destroyed. No more authority, 
as far as a governmental to actually officially put someone in jail or kill them. So the authority of the Sadducees and Pharisees were wiped out. Uh, so they could, uh, so how could this guy have been, you know, the founder of the group, an adult at 200 BC, die at 32 AD and be the same guy, 230 some years apart. So here's a few other points about this same story. This is from 4Q uh, 171, which is a commentary on Psalm 37. And it says that the wicked priest who watched the teacher of righteousness to kill him because of the ordinance of the law which he had sent to them or sent to him. Uh, so I think what this is saying basically is that there's a wicked priest, which would be the liar, which would be Caiaphas, uh, carefully watched the teacher of righteousness, that would be the Messiah, for a way to put him to death because his teaching was different than theirs and he, he threatened their authority. Um, and later on, that same paragraph says, at the end of 40 years, they shall be blotted out and the wicked shall no longer be found in the land of Israel. It's kind of, let me see if I can get that a little bit better here. There we go. That looks better. Um, so, um, and we see it down here a little bit further, but the wicked priest has the uh, teacher of righteousness put to death. And in this particular paragraph, he's trying to kill him. And then at the end of this, this time period, the people that follow the liar, the wicked priest, um, will be blotted out and no longer found in Israel. And that's about 40 years after the confrontation between the teacher of righteousness and the lying wicked priest. So again, if Jesus died in 32, give or take a year, whatever, but around 32, 40 years later, or about 40 years later, is the destruction of the temple. So somewhere around 32 AD is the prophesied teacher of righteousness that comes down as the latter rain, the former rain and the latter rain upon the earth uh, to give us healing in his wings. Uh, the one that is the Melchizedekian priest. So this is what this is saying. Now, if we go to the other commentary, 4Q173, it's a commentary on Psalms 127, 129, and 118. Why in that order? I don't know, but that's what they have. <clears throat> Supplications from the teacher of righteousness and the true priest at... I should add more to that. Yeah, this is a work in progress, as always. So there are supplications or... or things that the teacher of righteousness do and continue to do for us until the end of the age. I thought that was interesting because it talks about the end of the ages. So in their time period, all of this stuff about the first coming prophecies should be done and over before 75 AD, the end of their age. And the commentary on Micah, which is 1Q14 and then 4Q168, says uh, the they quote a passage in Micah, and then it says, This concerns the teacher of righteousness who expounded the law to his council, Jesus who taught the apostles, and to all who freely pledged themselves to join the elect of God and to keep the law of the council of the community, who shall be saved on the day of judgment. So you're saved because you are following the teacher of righteousness. Apparently, he has authority to save. So he is a the savior. So and here's uh, some of the stuff from the Damascus Covenant. I've just got this in red because I'm not sure the, the order that we'll have it in. But anyway, it says, From the day wherein was gathered the unique teacher, so when he was gathered in, I don't know if that means he started his ministry or he died or what, but with, we're talking about Jesus, it's three and a half year ministry anyway. So the beginning or end of his ministry or the ministry in general or his death, 32 AD, from the day that one was gathered in the unique teacher. And it's a different word for this, but it's pretty obvious we're talking about the teacher of righteousness, uh, the rod of Jesse, um, the unique teacher, 
all terms for the same person. So from the day this unique teacher was here to the destruction of all the warriors who followed the man of the lie or the liar, the lying priest, the wicked priest, will be about 40 years. So think about this. Um, people reject Messiah. They put him to death. They continue to follow the Sadducees and Pharisees. They continue to battle it out because they're apostate. They continue to battle against Rome. From the time the Messiah came, had his ministry, and died, about 40 years later, the Romans will come in, besiege the temple, and people who understand the prophecies understand the age of sacrifice is now over. There's no reason to be in the temple. If the Romans want it shut down, shut it down. It's not a big deal. And they just walk off, and the Romans allow them to walk off because they're peaceful. They're not, you know, vigilantes or that kind of thing. The people that say, no, we're going to do it our way because the Sadducees and the Pharisees command it, they barricade themselves in the temple and fight against the Romans. Well, what happened? The vast majority were, were killed, executed, not executed, but it was killed in battle. And I think it was like some 100,000 of them that barricaded in the temple were taken prisoners and sold into slavery by the Romans just to get them dispersed. And then the temple was destroyed which is what Jesus prophesied would happen in Matthew 24. So, but about 40 years. So 40 years exactly from 32 AD to 72 AD, that'd be 40 years. It was actually 38 years that the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. Now, 41 years later, the Alexandrian Jewish temple that the Essenes ran uh, Titus came to destroy it, besiege it, whatever. They understood the prophecies. They were just doing their, their stuff. But now it's the end of the age. Within three years, the Romans are here saying, shut down or we'll destroy you. They don't fight. They say, fine, here's the keys. We're, we're gone. We're believers. And they're allowed to walk away because they're not a problem. And the temple was shut down. It was never destroyed. It was just shut down. So that's pretty interesting. Now, from the Testaments, the Testaments are the writings of the, the patriarchs from Adam to Aaron. Some of them actually talk about the things that Messiah or the teacher of righteousness will do. So let's look at a few of these. In the Testament of Simeon, chapter 7, he's talking to his kids, and it's a prophecy about the Messiah. My children obey Levi and Judah, or obey Levi. In Judah, you will be redeemed. The Redeemer comes from the tribe of Judah. Do not rebel against these two tribes, for from them will arise the salvation of God. For the Lord will raise up from Levi, as it were, a priest, and also from Judah, as it were, a king, who is both God and man. So he will save all the Gentiles and Israel. So did you notice that? God and man. Consistent theme. Emmanuel. God with us. Very straightforward, very easy to understand. Um, and I've always wondered about why Levi and Judah. He's a direct descendant of Judah, therefore king. But I think somewhere in the midst of the, the marriages, he's also descended from Levi. And you can kind of see this because Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary, and she was married to Zacharias, who was a priest, to be of the tribe of Levi. So John the Baptist was a direct descendant of Levi through Aaron, Zadok priest, of course. Um, so that, but they were cousins. So somewhere along the line, the, it kind of merged. So really interesting. We don't have a direct record of who married who, and I'd like to get that, though. It's probably in here somewhere. Testament of Levi 18. So here's what Levi says about the situation. His star will arise from heaven. As a king shedding forth light of knowledge in the sunshine of the day, and he will be magnified in the world until his ascension. Concept of death, burial, and ascension was already uh, well talked about. But notice, you know, Peter says, uh, We have a more sure word of prophecy of which you would do well to take heed until the day star arises in your hearts. So the sun of righteousness, the day star, 
sunshine of the day. It's all metaphors of the Messiah, light and darkness. He will shine forth as the sun in the earth, will drive away all darkness from the world under heaven. There will be peace in all the earth. Definitely will be at the millennial reign. The heavens will rejoice in his days. The earth will be glad and the clouds will be joyful. And then Testament of Judah chapter 22 says this about the Messiah. He is the salvation of Israel. And the word salvation is Yeshua. Probably means the salvation of Israel, but it's also the Yeshua of Israel. Can, can always be a play on words. So he's the salvation of Israel that will come at the appearing of, this is interesting, the God of righteousness. The God of righteousness, the teacher of righteousness, who is God incarnate with healing in his wings. Consistent stuff back and forth. Testament of Judah chapter 24 says, After these things a star will arise to you from Jacob in peace. A man will arise from my seed, so a descendant of Judah, descendant of David, like the son of righteousness. Now, here we have a, a whole concept, son of righteousness, just like we read up before, the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So we're actually talking about, again, the son of righteousness. Walking with the sons of men in meekness. He appears as a man, he's, he's the God of righteousness, the teacher of righteousness, walking in meekness with men and in righteousness. There's no sin found in him, which is cool. Same thing that John says. The heavens will be opened above to him to shed forth the blessing of the Spirit from the Holy Father. So the Spirit is given in some form different than the way it was back then. He will shed forth a spirit of grace upon you. Spirit of grace. It's kind of an interesting choice of words. You will be to him sons in truth or sons of truth. You will also walk in his commandments, the first and the last. We don't walk necessarily in the Mosaic commandments, but in the Messiah's commandments. For all practical purposes, they're the same thing. It's the moral parts. If you understand the law of Moses correctly, you would understand they're the same. This is the branch of God Most High, the, the Nazarene, the branch. This is the wellspring unto life for all flesh. Remember what Jesus said about if you believe in him, out of your bellies will flow living water. I think it's connected with all these, the wellspring. The scepter of my kingdom will shine forth. From your root, a stem will arise, you know, the rod of Jesse from the root of the, the tree. It will arise as a rod of righteousness to the Gentiles to judge and save all that call upon the Lord. Paul said the same thing. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So here's the Testament of Asher. We're not going to go through a whole lot more, but I just wanted to be thorough in that teacher of righteousness part. Asher says this. You will be disregarded in a dispersion like useless water. There's going to be this dispersion by the Romans um, or Babylon uh, until the Most High will visit earth. That's one of the times of visitation it keeps talking about. So the Most High, that would be God, says he will come as a man eating and drinking with men and in peace he will break the head of the dragon through the water. He will save Israel and all the nations, God speaking in the person of a man. Therefore, teach these things to your children so you will not disobey him. If they kept in mind the whole concept of the Messiah, who he is, what he does, they wouldn't miss him. But the lie was so deceptive that half of Israel or a good part of Israel missed him. Much like the apostasy in our church. If you're a person that says, I don't want to take anybody's word for it, I'm going to listen to a few people, I'm going to go to church, but I'm going to take some time on my own and I'm going to read the Bible. Maybe some commentaries too. So if everything could be a little off. I'll read it through and then I'll study the prophecies and the, and the morality and things several times. And after I've 
studied it three, four, or five times, I should have a really good grasp of understanding of what it means, and then I'll decide for myself. If you do that, you will not fall into any kind of weird theology. You might for a short time, but if you keep reading the scriptures, it will dawn on you what the idioms mean, and it'll become very clear. <clears throat> Testament of Benjamin. The Most High will send forth his salvation in the visitation of his only begotten one. So there's only one Messiah, uh, two, com two comings, but he's the only begotten of the Father. Testament of Aaron. Remember, this is Moses' brother. This is pretty cool. Uh, his word will be like the word of heaven. His teaching will be in accordance with the will of God. His eternal sun will burn bright. The fire will be kindled, kindled on all the corners of the earth, and it will shine into the darkness. So that's just really cool. Remember Aaron, in the Testament of Aaron, he's the one that talks about if you want to be in God's grace when the Messiah comes, have nothing to do with the nails. So and if this was written by Aaron, that would have been about 1400 BC. Messiah comes in 32 AD, is crucified obviously have nothing to do with the government structure that crucifies the Messiah if you want to be in God's grace. Again, it wouldn't be hard, though. All the prophecies, if you took them literal, there's going to be a guy named Yeshua. He's going to be raising the dead, healing the blind. He comes in 32 AD. He's put to death because of our for to pay the penalty for our sin nature. Uh, some of the signs that happen when this happens, the veil of the temple will be ripped in half. And then there's several other things. So if you had believed that and been taught that as not symbolic but literal, and you're actually literally looking for it, and then one day you see that happen, you know it's not hard. So here's that verse I was talking about, 1 Peter 1.19. You've also a more sure word of prophecy. Prophecy sometimes can be vague, but parts of it can be very, very sure. We have a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto you would do well to take heed as to a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So this is all that symbolism about the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. So here is, and we've talked about this before too, we should have a video specifically on 11Q13. But that scroll refers to the Messiah as the final Melchizedekian priest. Okay. And it actually says in the scroll that the Messiah, or not the Messiah, but this Melchizedek, is God. So God incarnates, apparently. When he comes, he will pay the penalty of our sin nature, which reconciles us to God. It doesn't actually say in that one that he dies, but he does something that reconciles us to God. You have to kind of put them all together. Uh, but he's put to death by the wicked priest. And obviously, that's the event that does it. This event occurs exactly, and this is what it says in the text, one Shemitah, which is a seven-year period, after the end of the ninth Jubilee, Jubilees are 50-year periods, of their age. So the end of their age was the end of the eighth Ono, which is a 500-year period. Okay, And so... One thing you can say easily for sure that the 30s AD or even the 1st and 2nd century BC and AD put together, however you want to do it, is inside of a 500-year period. So it's really easy to find out the Ona or the 500-year period. So at the end of that, which would be 75 AD on their calendar, if you back up 50 years, that brings us to 25 AD. 75 minus 50 is 25. Uh, and then from there, that's the end of the ninth Jubilee. And then one Shemitah later, which is exactly seven years, no extra years, 25 plus seven is 32. So according to their calendar, the Messiah was supposed to die and pay penalty to God, which reconciles us because of our problem with our sin nature. That event, whatever that event is, occurs in 32 AD. And again, the teacher of righteousness, you know. So this has just been a small study in this, but I wanted to kind of pull this together. So if the teacher of righteousness, and I go back up here to the top, if the teacher of righteousness is 
the Melchizedekian priest who is God incarnate, who comes to die for our sins in 32 AD. He's consistently talked about as God in man, brings salvation. He, if he's alive in 32 AD, he couldn't, if he's a normal guy, he couldn't be alive in 200 BC. So we're not talking about the founder of the Essenes or anything else. It's really, really specific. The unique teacher, the teacher of righteousness, the rod of Jesse, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings are all referring to the same person. So really straightforward. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight, and then I'll come to the um, chat room and we'll look at some questions. But hopefully you guys like that. It, these things are really interesting to me. And again, you didn't learn a single thing, really, that you don't already know. If you believe the New Testament, you know Jesus is Messiah. He's God incarnate. He paid for your sins. You believe on him, you're saved. You don't, you're not. Straightforward. But to see these guys teaching the same thing uh, all through the different manuscripts is pretty amazing. Let me go through here and see if there's any questions now. Okay, one question. Let's see. Please remind me on how they came to which month was on the first month on the on Enoch's civil calendar. I realize it was changed in Exodus 12, but how was it set up? Well, according to the Essenes, the original calendar is a solar calendar that always starts at the spring equinox. But to keep you know, at the end of the year, it's a 364 day year. So that means all the weeks are even. So when you start instead of a 365, a 364, every year starts on the same year. And it's always the Wednesday closest to the spring equinox. What happens is that the equinox begins to drift back one or two days every year. When it gets four days away, it's actually in a different week. So when it gets out of that one week's time, Within more than more than three days away from the equinox, you add a leap week, and then it takes five to six years for it to go through before you add another leap week. Um, and so that's the way that that works um, as far as that goes. So the spring equinox is that time period. And we know from the scrolls that they didn't add extra days. It was a 364 count, and that keeps everything in sync and all of the Sabbaths. Now, our calendar, for instance, by contrast, is a 365-day calendar. Uh, no matter what you use, you're going to have to have a leap something. Because you a calendar has to be an even number of days. And the actual days in a year is 365.2422 days. Uh, so you can't divide it. You just got to wait until there's... We wait till there's an extra day and then add the day. Um, and I think that's accurate up to like 3,000 years or something, the way the Gregorian calendar does it. Um, but you'll notice the weeks are off. We keep the weeks in sync separately. But our New Year, for instance, every year it's on a different day. If New Year was Wednesday this last year, next year it's going to be not a Wednesday for sure. Um, so if we kept everything succinct, there would be an extra day or two and then the week would start over. That would mess up the week flow. And it's really important to keep that seven-day cycle. So that's basically the way that it works. Uh, and that's the original calendar. Now, later on, they changed something. And I don't know if it was legitimate or what way back when. But it seems like there were two different calendars. But then when the Pharisees in the second century BC changed everything, they changed it over to a lunar calendar. And if you think about this, again, you have to have a leap something. They start with the... Uh, new moon closest to how it's figured is the new moon closest to the spring equinox their actual new year is in the fall but they're trying to do a lunar thing so that means it goes back up to 10 days per year so every three to four years you have to have a leap month so think about that in three years the calendar is off an entire month and then it gets put back so you can see how that's not the exact best way to do it uh, so anyway, but so that's what their teaching is. Uh, 
Um, okay, the in Hosea 12, you have uh, you're on Zedek. Is it supposed to be Mora Zedek? It's actually a different word. Mora means teacher in the idea of a, a direct teaching, like with tests. You know, I'm going to make you hardcore. You're going to, I'm going to make you memorize this. Yeran is more like a loose flowing teaching style. So if you just watch me after a while and practice on your own, you'll figure it out and you'll become good at what you do. Not necessarily any tests or anything, but it's just different words for this. And it's interesting to me that you can have that, especially as a deck, and that's supposed to be rain, which is kind of odd. But uh, but anyway, more as a deck or yarns the deck uh, are normally used as teachers of righteousness. Zedek is always righteousness. Uh, Mora or, or the other word there is for teacher. But interesting. So, oh, okay. Got my copies of Josh Peck's and your new Skywatch book today. Okay. I was told that the, um, maybe there's just some sort of a glitch, but I was told that my, my stuff was not supposed to be out for like another month or something. I noticed Josh's was out, but let's take a peek at that real quick. I'm just curious. Oh, not that one. Store here. Here's mine. Let's see. Oh, no, it looks like it's out. Okay. I, I was told there was a glitch to something and it wasn't going to be. Maybe that's something else, but that is really cool. One rating. So maybe it was just a few days before it came out. Okay, that's neat. All right, I'll have to keep keep a ch check on that. Yeah, and for you guys looking at it, I don't mean to discourage you or anything, but just to let you know, these three books, and you may already have them if you follow us a lot, but Patriarchs, Calendar, and Melchizedek were put together in this. So this book that they just released is these three put together. So if you already have them, then you don't necessarily need to get that book. But if you don't have any of them, you might get that one instead. Because these, these would be $10 a piece. Actually, with shipping and handling, with more like fifteen a piece, so that's like forty-five, and this is twenty-five, so that would save a little bit. So that's cool. I hope you like them. Okay. So they have some. Okay. Okay. Let's see what's going on. When did the word Gentile come into existence, and what did it mean? If it's in the Testament of Simeon, it had to be around before the word Jew, since the word started after Babylon. Yeah, probably. Um, in, in the Old Testament, it's the word Goy, and it simply means nations. And the whole concept was uh, the descendants of Noah were Goyim, gen, uh, just nations or Gentiles. Uh, it's the same word in, in Hebrew, but originally it was just nations. And that whole concept was somewhere along the line, the Lord would pick somebody like Abraham and through him start a special goyim, a special goy, or a special nation. And that would be the nation of Israel or uh, the Jews as it became later. Originally, one of the tribes of Israel was Judah. And Jews actually comes from the Judah or Judahites, that kind of thing. But what had happened was somewhere along the line, uh, the kingdom split and it became the kingdom of Judah to the south and the kingdom of Israel to the north. So they were taken into captivity. When they came back from Babylon, they were just called the nation of, of uh, Judah from Jews. It's the nation of Israel, but they were called Jews. So... That's basically how it came. Now, our word Jew, though, is probably a contraction of it that came along much later. But when you go back in the Old Testament, you'll see goyim all over the place. And it just means nation. But once the nation of Israel came, we finally had the special nation and all the other nations. Not that the other nations aren't any more important than anybody else, but the nation of Israel had a special job to do. And so that's what we're talking about. Gentile in that point didn't mean anything bad. But later on, uh, especially with Pharisee concepts, the Gentiles are no good. And most of them were um, idolaters as far as the governments were. So they turned evil pretty, pretty bad. 
Then again, so did the Jewish nation government structure. Somehow government structures always go bad when they're allowed to do whatever they want. Um, is it possible that there have been or will be more visitation during times of trouble? It seems to be that way. At the very least, there's a time of visitation where God moves on uh, first and second coming. But obviously God moved with the flood and moved on the children of Israel, at least, for the Babylonian exile and the Roman exile. Um, and so that's definite, definite uh, possibility. Um, other places talk about visitations as just God moving. And so if God was to visit us right now, it would be a judgment, of course. But if you and I are Christians, we're, we're, we'll be judged and judged, you know, righteous as because of Christ. Um, kind of like a judgment seat, beam a judgment seat or something, I suppose. Yeah, if you're not a Christian, you don't want a visitation. Uh, if you are a Christian, you would love a visitation. A rapture, uh, even even death. You know, we get to stand before the Lord. Don't like that dying process, but to be before the Lord would be good. And we wouldn't. It wouldn't be perfect because we always want to be clothed. We want to have a body, but we'll have our glorified body eventually. So yeah, it definitely seems like it. Um, actually, no. Do we know the date of Enoch's rapture uh, per the Zadok calendar? No, really don't. Um, uh, Enoch and Elijah both, they seem to know the exact date. Um, and, and the scripture says everybody, all the prophets knew the exact date, but I don't see it recorded anywhere. That was one of the things I was really curious about, especially Elijah, because we've got all the, the um, sons of the prophets teasing Elijah's um servant saying your master goes up today or your master goes up tomorrow or whatever and he's like yeah i know don't rub it in so everybody knew but yeah as far as i know there's no no date recorded anywhere hopefully we'll find one though that would be interesting adam asks if the essenes were referencing the new covenant before it was written down using the same greek word a covenant or testament Further proof Jesus taught them the new covenant. Yeah, uh, definitely. Look up Strong's 12. To, yeah, yeah, it was prophesied. And of course, you can even see this in, um, I think it's Jeremiah. Is it Jeremiah? Jeremiah 31 talks about, I will make a new covenant with, with the nations and the nation of Israel, not like the, the covenant I made with their fathers, which is always consistent because when he makes the covenant with Moses, Moses says, this is a new covenant I'm making just for the children of Israel. And it's not like the covenant that I made through Noah in the past, the Noahite covenant. So it's an extension. It's different. But then Jeremiah says, they'll come to pass that a new covenant will be made that's different from that of Moses, presumably slightly different from the Noahic covenant also. But um, so, yeah, they they understood it and under and followed it quite a bit. The new covenant was supposed to be when Messiah comes, he changes some stuff and whatever he says, just do it. You know, that kind of a thing was what was consistently taught. And then the rabbis got to the point, it's like, no, you have to follow the, the law, the Torah, the way we interpret it. And if the Messiah changes anything, he's a false Messiah and we kill him. It's like, that's not the way that it works. So, but that's pretty cool. Thank you. Oh, neat. I'll have to look that up. In the Nativity story, the movie, the Nativity story, shows one of the Magi quoting from the Testament of Judah, alluding to the fact that they had access to the Testaments of the Patriarchs. Do you think that was possible? Uh, yeah, I definitely think that was possible. If you believe the scrolls, the whole concept is that Moses um, started what we call the Old Testament, by giving a synopsis of history. You know, I mean, like, for instance, you might ask the question, uh, where did he know about Seth and Enos and, and Mahaliel and Jared and Enoch and this and that and the other one? Where did Jude get the idea that there was a book of Enoch? You know, where did, you know, 
there's little things all the way through the, uh, the text that lets you know that there were other records. Josephus even mentions, and this, this struck me really hard one time. I was reading at the very beginning of Josephus, and he's talking about the 10 patriarchs pre-flood, Adam to Noah. And he makes this weird comment. He says, it would be very tedious to name all of the sons of Adam, so we will just name the 10 and then start with the flood, kind of, and go forward. And I had to stop at that. It's like, wait a minute, tedious? If you had time and you really wanted to, you could do that. You could name, you could write down on your paper all the names of the children of Adam. So there is a record somewhere that you could look up, make sure it's spelled right, and you could copy them. But it would be too tedious for you to do that, so you're going to skip over it. So even in the first century, there are records like that. Just kind of an interesting thought. And the... the um, his scenes are saying, we have those records. They're the testaments of all the patriarchs. And we believe them to be legit. Kind of like a pre-Old Testament canon. And if you believe them and you follow them, it's it's their, their, their dads to their kids. So it's really, I feel kind of creepy reading it. It's like reading somebody's last will and testament, what they're leaving their kids and all. But it's there's some amazing moral uh, uh, points to it some amazing prophecies, that kind of thing. But if you believe what it says, if you really think Noah wrote Noah, Noah's testament and Abraham actually wrote Abraham's testament and those kind of things, and Enos, second from Adam. And even Josephus mentions a prophecy that Adam gave. He wouldn't have been able to know that had there not been a testament of Adam in his day. So the rabbis knew that stuff, the ones that wanted to reject Messiah said, okay, there used to be real ones, but all this stuff is made up, obviously, you know, because we reject the Essene notion. And the Essenes said, no, we follow the Testaments. So since you disagree with them, we're going to say your oral Torah from Moses is a lie. Because there's no way that the Moses, being a prophet of God, would contradict the Messiah. So if you're telling us he did, you're lying. So there's this big debate this way. So with that in mind, if that still existed in the first century, even if it was pushed out, well, like, for instance, today, if I was to say I'm a Roman Catholic, uh, I'm not, I'm a Calvary Chapel guy, but if I was a Roman Catholic, you, you would know that my Bible has the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Apocrypha. And maybe you like the Apocrypha, and maybe you don't, but you know that I have extra books in my canon, right? And so it's the same thing. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Maybe you think it's real or not, but you know about it. So all the Jews would have known about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Samaritans, the Essenes, anybody that's wanting to study. Because there's only seven major sects, and then each one of those are broke up. Here in America, we've got tons of them. But everybody knows what a Catholic is. Everybody knows what a Baptist is and like a Methodist or something like that, the big ones, everybody, you may not know all the details, but if you'd start asking, why are you not a Baptist? I mean, what makes you a Methodist or a Catholic compared to a Baptist? What's, what are some of the differences? And if they would tell you, because they're trying to convert you, then you would lear learn that stuff. So with that in mind, then, the Magi, according to the church fathers, were people from Persia, that when Persia conquered um, uh, Babylon, uh, Daniel was in Babylon under the Babylonians, then, then the, uh, the Persians under Cyrus conquers, and then uh, he's already a master in the court. And according to this, he teaches the prophecies to them because the prophecies talked, named Cyrus directly. And the way he captured Babylon is exactly what's prophesied in Scripture. So there's no way around that. So people watched this, studied under Daniel, and knew what the prophets taught. And so then the Magi would understand uh, that the Messiah would be born, presumably just because he saw the star. you know. But it also could be several other things, other testaments, other documents, whatever uh, Daniel would have talked or taught them. So yeah, definite possibility. Now, we're not trying to add 
the Testaments of the Patriarchs to the canon or anything like that. The canon starts with Moses, Genesis, and it goes through Malachi. And according to the church fathers, uh, actually the Essenes, the, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and basically everybody, the canon was closed. So the Old Testament canon proper, which is the public canon, everybody's supposed to have one or have access to it. So you could be anybody, waltz into a, a synagogue, or maybe Jewish anybody, but go into a synagogue and they should have a copy of scriptures. And if you want to look at it, ask the rabbi a question, that's what they're there for. So everyone should have access to that. Now, the other records, only certain people had access to them. Most of that stuff is like uh, genealogies and edicts of kings and stuff like that that we wouldn't even care about. But the testaments would have been in there also. But that's cool. I'll have to go back and look at the nativity story. From the looks of it, all the Peshers were written after Jesus came to teach them at Qumran. Any reason you th to think otherwise? Um, I don't know for sure. Some of them are in, are written like that, like the teacher of righteousness did come and, and this happened. And, and other times they're written in a uh, prophetic style. So it could be, it could be both actually. I mean, if, um, if we're writing like, if I'm writing a book and I'm quoting uh, Isaiah 17, sometime in the future, Damascus will be destroyed and it'll be like this and it'll happen this way, but we just don't know when. Say it happened today and this year I write a book on it. It would be the prophecy said this and this is how it happened. So it could be a little bit of both, but we understand that the prophecies are future uh, if you believe in, you actually believe in prophecy, uh, and some of these are, are other commentary added. So that is interesting though. Is it possible they changed the calendar to hide Jesus? Yeah, actually that's what it says in the Seder Alam. Uh, there's a book on chronology and let me go back here. The first book I did was, uh, ancient post-flood history. And that was me trying to pull early post-flood history from the flood to the exodus from Egypt, what was going on in all the different nations and how to identify which nation was what, that kind of stuff. So that's my research in it. But the Seder Alam, this one here, was a Jewish guy doing the same thing uh, back about 160 AD. So he's following the unbelieving rabbis and he writes this text, and basically it, it's amazing. It goes through all the chronology, got all the dates right, all the way up to the destruction of the temple. And basically he, he stops and he says, there was a rabbi in his day, with all due respect, a rabbi named Yoshi, that didn't like the whole concept of Jesus being Messiah. It's just too coincidental. So he tries to take Daniel 9 and says it's not from the time of the of the command to restore Jerusalem to the death of the Messiah. It's actually from the destruction of the first temple to the destruction of the second temple. And then in doing that, they kind of tweak the numbers and put stuff together and take them out. And he's rejected twice by this. He comes up with one theory and it just flat won't fly. So then later on, he comes up with a second theory. And you can tell he's just trying to make it fit according to the Seder. And that doesn't fly either, so it's dismissed. Rabbi Yoshi's, you know, forget about him. But then a few hundred years later, somehow it's adop adapted. Um, and when we come here for like, for instance, our DSS calendar, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Seder Alam, this should be the year, 5946. According to modern Judaism, it's the year 5782. It's, I think it's 218 years difference or something like that. Um, on here. No, that's not right. 160. Yeah, 160 some years difference. Um, anyway, um, so what happened? How did that happen? And the Seder actually explains that. It explains how that works. So it's recorded in this. And this is actually a Jewish document, rabbinical. So it's not Dead Sea Scroll. 
but to actually have that information in it is pretty interesting. So to answer your question, yes, it was because they wanted to make sure nobody equated Daniel 9 with Jesus Christ. At least that was Rabbi Yoshi's idea. Um, if the Peshers were written after Jesus taught them, does that explain why their interpretations can blow our minds and vary so widely from common interpretations? Yeah, definite possibility. Um, and it looks like some are and some are not. So, I mean, it, it is it is amazing. In either case, though, obviously these guys were believers in Messiah. Can I send my Skywatch book for you to autograph? We'll pay the shipping. Sure. We can do that and send it back to you. How do you reply to someone in the chat? I believe and you should be able to right-click on it and do a uh, reply in thread or something like that. I'm using something that pulls all of them together so I can throw it up here on the bottom. So I don't really see it, but it should be something like that. I know people do. Diane says, we could drive to Kansas and have him sign them. Oh, you're welcome anytime. I'm sure they'd love, love, love we'd love to have you at church too. And stay for a church service. Yeah, exactly. That would be cool. Yeah, the church would be really thrilled to have a whole bunch of you guys come at the same time. That'd be neat. And it's okay. And... Um, let's see here. If we only found so many of the texts in the caves because they were all hidden in a rush and under a crisis circumstance, where were the rest of the scrolls? They took some of them somewhere. It's possible. Um, uh, it's, it's obvious because of the, the fragmentation of some of the manuscripts. Some of the scrolls were there, whatever they were, and were destroyed enough that you can't make heads or tails out of them. When you get like a hundred little fragments that are literally about this big and it has half of a word on it. There is no way you could piece that thing together. Uh, at least as far as I know, maybe somebody can figure out based on the linen and which ones go and what direction. And But then again, you've got so many pieces of it that's actually missing. Like the word God, if it, you just have the G on it, it could be Gad, it could be God, it could be great. It'd be really hard. So obviously a lot more is there than we are able to piece together, but at least we have some of these things. And the neat thing about it is everybody knew throughout the centuries that scrolls were hidden in the caves. There was legends and people were always looking for it because if you could find one, you could sell it to some patriarch at somewhere, some church or somebody, and they'd pay you a lot of money for it. And so people did that. And if you couldn't find them, people would make fake ones. So there's fake ones and real ones floating out there. And that's how, uh, like the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs were, were thought to be Christian fiction until uh, pieces of four of them were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So now they actually were found in Hebrew in that concept and said the same thing. So obviously they're real. And so now we go back to them. Of course, we don't have just the 12. We have some 20 of them, pieces of 20 of them. Um, but it's also possible that they have copies somewhere. I mean, um, the thing is, if you think about it, this is kind of important. So preserving it in the Dead Sea for people later on to find to know that nobody's tampered with it over the years is an important piece to the puzzle. But then <clears throat> it could also be destroyed or garbled or half destroyed. So if you know the prophecies then you would make plans 
earlier. I mean, Jesus comes in 32 AD and nothing's destroyed until 70. You, you know, the prophecies there are about 40 years. I think inside of 40 years, you could copy a lot and move a lot. So I'm pretty sure there's something somewhere. And some of the scrolls talk about uh, the end times before the, when the evil guy comes right before the uh, beginning of the kingdom and stuff like that. So I, I think there is something somewhere. So I'm really confident. I, I'm getting toward the end of this. So I'll have the Dead Sea Scrolls pretty much done. We can study them and everything. And that's it. There's about a thousand fragments that are studyable uh, from the scrolls, but more things are popping up. So there's the Geniza. There are, there's actually several places around the planet that have medieval copies. But when you compare the pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls to them, they're word perfect. You know, they're actually in Hebrew. And, you know, there's no way that somebody could know this piece would survive and this one wouldn't to change it. So if it's word perfect, it's word perfect. So we have things like that to look for. And I really think that there are uh, more scrolls that will come out soon. Yeah, is it possible to get your books in digital form like ebook? Yes, you can go to, um, well, when you go like buy one of these through Amazon, uh, there's Kindle, audiobook, and paperback. So you can do price drop. Oh, interesting. So anyway, let me get out of that here. Um, so anyway, you can get the audiobook from Audible. They partner with them, and we've done all of those in audio form and Kindle and paperback. So you should be able to get any of those. Be cool. Okay. Okay. I'm talking about several other things. Okay. All right. Uh, so it's 817. We'll go ahead and stop there for tonight and we'll have our Q&A Thursday. And then next week we'll continue studying probably the, the Damascus covenant and see what else we can dig up with it. But uh, thank you guys. Uh, have a good night and we will see you uh, Thursday.